this session. The first thing you've got to do when you get downloaded and install the uh, debugging tools is give it a pointer to the symbol files for the version of the OS that you're going to be wanting to analyze a crash from. So I'm going to go over to the, back to the laptop here and fire up the debugger. And the place where you configure the symbols is in the file menu under the symbol file path. Back in the old days, to do crash analysis, you had to go out and get the symbol files from the DVD that, or CD that Windows came with Windows or go to the Windows website and download it from there. And then you had to do your own file management of keeping track of which versions of the symbol files you had, which version of Windows they were from, and pointing the debugging engine at the right one for whatever crash you're looking at. Microsoft made this brainless now with something called the symbol server. And I've configured the debugger here to use the symbol server. The magic syntax there is that SRV prefix. And then within the stars or the asterisks, you specify the directory under which you want it to manage symbols for you. And then you point it at the symbol server website. No need to write this down, actually, because it's right in the, on the debugging tools homepage and in the help file. What this causes is that whenever the debugger looks at a crash, and it needs the symbols for a particular image that it sees, like the operating system kernel, it looks in that local cache directory that you specified, and if it can't find it, goes to the symbol server and pulls it down and sticks it there. Let's go take a look at what that directory looks like on my machine. So I've put it under C symbols, my favorite place to put it. And you can see that there's directories there for a lot of different Windows components. I'm going to search for mtkernelmp.pdb, and you can see that for the multiprocessor version of the operating system kernel, I've analyzed dumps from three, different, from three different crashes with three different versions of that operating system file. And they're identified with a unique hash number so that they don't collide. And if you look in one of those directories, you'll find the actual symbol file, the PDB file for that particular version that the debugging engine is going to use. Our next concept is IRQL. And you've all been exposed to that term when you've seen the IRQL that was equal bug check. IRQL stands for interrupt request level. In the Windows operating system, each processor has its own notion of an interrupt request level that it uses to mask off interrupts. So it maps hardware interrupts and software interrupts into its own internal IRQL table. And when an interrupt comes in from a particular device, for example, it raises the IRQ of that processor up to that level that it's defined for that device, and that causes interrupts from other devices at that level and below, including software interrupts, from being masked off until the, this interrupt has finished being serviced. The key IRQLs on that chart are passive level at the bottom, which is what Windows tries to remain at all the time. Even when it's in kernel mode, it wants to be at passive level, meaning that no interrupts are masked off. User mode code is always executed at passive level, so you can never be in user mode code at any higher IRQL. Kernel mode code can raise the IRQL up, well, of course, in response to a hardware interrupt, but also for certain software operations, like synchronizing between two CPUs in the operating system kernel. That's done by acquiring something called a spin lock. And when a spin lock is acquired, the IRQL is raised up to that second level right there, dispatch level. Dispatch level is a level that causes the scheduler to get turned off, because the Windows scheduler relies on internal synchronization at that level. And this causes two rules to come into effect for device driver developers. One rule is that their thread can't yield the CPU. If they're at dispatch level, they can't tell the scheduler, hey, um, I need to wait for something to happen. Go find another thread to run. The scheduler is going to go, hey, I can't do that right now. Uh, you're violating my synchronization rules and it will call KE bug check EX with RQL and Atlas or equal. The second rule that they've introduced is, is introduced at this level is that page faults cannot be serviced. Page faults, because what happens for a piece of memory, if a driver tries to access a piece of memory and that memory is physically present, well, there's no page fault, so, which is fine. But if that piece of memory happens to be Virtual memory happens to correspond to data that's out on disk, like in the paging file, or an image file, or data file, then a page fault is going to occur. And the memory manager tries to service that transparently. 
it's going to issue a disk I.O. to go read that data that has just been faulted for. Now, what does that thread do while, it's, while that I.O. is in progress? It has to wait. And waiting is a violation of that first rule. So the two rules are somewhat interrelated, but those occur at dispatch level. The next concept is the stack. And the stack is an area of temporary storage. Each thread in Windows has two of these, one that it uses while it's in user mode, one that it uses while it's in kernel mode. The user mode stack is usually one megabyte in size. It's up to app developer to, to control that. That's the default. And the kernel mode stack is usually 12 kilobytes. Some threads in kernel mode have larger stacks if they're doing Windows stuff of 20 kil kilobytes. But you can see very small stacks in kernel mode. And what stacks allow is for nested function execution, where a developer divides their code up into different subroutines. And when one function calls another function, uh, something called a stack frame is created. You can see over here on the right side that parameter, a parameter has been passed to this function over here by placing that parameter on the stack in that stack uh, function stack frame. Then the system jumped to that function but it recorded the address that it came from so that after that function's done, it can get back there. This function has allocated, has used that temporary storage both to set up a frame pointer and to store local variables that are temporary and will be released off the stack, deallocated from the stack when that function returns. If that function calls another function, you get another stack frame. And this function one calling function two, it's passing three parameters. The return address back into function one is saved here on the stack. And then function two has set up its own frame pointer and local variables. And that can continue indefinitely. Stacks are very easy to interpret if the functions use what are called standard calling conventions, where they set up an explicit stack frame, as you saw on that slide. But there's calling conventions that are used by the Windows drivers and the operating system that don't do that. They don't do it for performance reasons. So they've, there's no frame pointer or frame pointer emitted calling convention. And then there's passing arguments in registers instead of on the stack. A debugger, in order to interpret stacks that have those non-standard frames in it, requires the symbol information for the function that ha owns that stack frame. And that's always going to be the case if you're looking at Windows' own code, the operating system kernel or other Microsoft components. But third-party drivers don't typically make their symbol files available. It's part of their IP. And so the debugger can run into situations where it has to make guesses. And you're going to see, as we analyze some dumps, where it spits out a message that says, hey, I don't know really what the stack look frames look like here because I don't have information for this particular driver, but I'm going to take a guess. Most of the time, it's guess is right. But if you're troubleshooting a, a serious problem and you have a relationship with the vendor of the driver that you think might be causing the problem, get them to share the symbol file with you so that you can better analyze their dumps. So let's talk, turn now to actually generating a crash. And what I'm going to do first is generate what I call an easy crash. The tool that we're going to use is a tool that I wrote. It's available there in that zip file on system kernels, both in executable and source form. Believe it or not, I'm willing to share this super advanced technology, crashing technology with you guys. And the tool that you're going to run is called Not My Fault. That name actually accomplishes two purposes for me. One, if you run it and crash your machine, it's not my fault. It's your fault. But the second uh, purpose that it accomplishes is that it highlights the fact that using user mode code, you can't directly crash the system. You have to rely on something in kernel mode. And not my fault has a buddy in kernel mode called my fault. That driver does the actual crashing. Just not my fault tells it how to crash the machine. So let's generate an easy crash. And before I do that, let's talk about what, it's gonna, what not my fault is going to cause my fault to do. My fault is going to allocate a block of paged kernel memory. Then it's going to free that block of memory. Then it's going to raise the RQL up to above dispatch level. Then it's going to touch that buffer, not only that buffer, but continue going through memory as far as it can go until it gets stopped by something. The reason why it's doing all of these really bad things is touching, first of all, memory that it doesn't own anymore, memory that belongs to other drivers, and touching paged memory at an RQL so high is that if it only did one or uh, some subset of those things, then it might get away with it. And I want to make this an easy analyzed crash, so I want it to be caught red-handed right in the process of doing something bad. So let's go see that in action. So I've got a v my VM here, and 
not my fault, is showing there. I'm going to press the do bug 